Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning. Um, it's morning here in central New York State, in Ithaca, New York, where I live. Um, so good morning. Uh, welcome to my talk. Um, my name is Paul Anderson. I'm VP of Engineering at Gramatech. I've been working in the field of static analysis for over 20 years. Some of you may have attended my talk yesterday where I was talking about the uh, our static analysis tool named CodeSonar, which is designed to find uh, serious bugs in software. Um, so today, however, I'm going to be talking about a completely different form of static analysis, uh, which is used for a slightly different purpose. Uh, so that purpose is finding end-day security vulnerabilities in third-party software. So basically, think of this as a way of analyzing binary code to find security vulnerabilities that are already known. So um, let me get into the outline first. So what I'll talk about to begin with is, uh, well, first of all, I'll set some context and describe why there is a need for tools that, that do detection of end day vulnerabilities. I will then define end day vulnerabilities and contrast them with zero day vulnerabilities so that you understand uh, what the major differences are there. I will then talk about the risks of third party software and especially the use of open source software and the use of open source software in binary form. Then I will have a discussion on the way that we can detect end day vulnerabilities and I'll then wrap up with uh, describing how we detect them for binaries. And I'll give you a little bit of a preview of the tool that we have developed called Code Sentry, which is capable of doing this. Okay, so first of all, some motivation. So you're probably all familiar with seeing headlines like this. Uh, barely a day goes by without a new security vulnerability being announced. Uh, Many of these vulnerabilities are zero day, meaning that they've just been found and, uh, uh, and patches not necessarily available. So they're announced uh, with great fanfare to encourage people to go out and, uh, and defend against them in some way and, uh, and maybe apply patches as soon as the patches become available. So it's not just uh, application software or server software or internet software that's at risk. It's software that's everywhere and very much including software driving the Internet of Things or automotive or other embedded uh, applications. So these vulnerabilities are extremely widespread and, uh, and in fact they're growing. Now um, OWASP, uh, which is an organization dedicated to software quality of mostly internet-facing applications, have recognized that there is a huge problem with uh, using components that have vulnerabilities that are already known. So if you look at the OWASP top 10, which is the you know, top 10 rules you should follow to make your application most secure, number nine in that list is uh, don't use components if they are known to contain vulnerabilities already. So they recognize this, just highlighting a couple of these uh, phrases out of this description. The, the prevalence of this problem is extremely widespread. And furthermore, most of the most significant security breaches in recent years have been due to the fact that uh, the attackers were able to exploit vulnerabilities that were already known. So let me just first of all, talk about the difference between zero-day and end-day vulnerabilities. So zero days are vulnerabilities that have just been found and or just been disclosed. Uh, so as a consequence of that, no patch is necessarily available on day one. Uh, and, and that's both good and bad. So first of all, it means that uh, everybody who's using that software is, uh, is potentially vulnerable to an exploit. But um, usually when these things are announced, the bad guys rush to create exploits against them. And that is not an instantaneous process. It takes some time for exploits to become available for these zero days, in which case there's this window of opportunity 
where the manufacturers of the software are scrambling to create patches or other mitigations, and the bad guys are scrambling to create exploits. So in that sense, it's both good and bad. However, end-day vulnerabilities are in contrast to zero days in that they, they have been announced previously and a patch is available. Now that's both, again, there's a good side and a bad side. The good side is that a patch is typically available. The bad side is that exploits against the vulnerability are likely to be very common in the wild because after a few days or a couple of weeks, the bad guys will have developed an exploit and will be uh, likely uh, trawling versus uh, resources to, to find machines that are vulnerable to that exploit and, uh, and taking advantage of it. So the problem is unfortunately getting a lot worse. So this is a snapshot taken yesterday of uh, disclosures of NDA vulnerabilities from the National Vulnerability Database, which is uh, organized by the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology here in the US. So as you can see there, the, sleep, the slope is sharply upward, especially in recent years. Last year, there were in excess of 18,000 vulnerabilities disclosed in software systems. And uh, we're about a third of the way into this year, and we're already uh, approaching 6,000, so we're on track to uh, maybe match or exceed the, the total from last year. And notice also in here, so you see that color coding, low, medium, high, those are the, uh, uh, the, the severity scores for the vulnerabilities. So the proportion of vulnerabilities that are severe doesn't seem to be changing very much. And so that indicates that the, uh, the situation isn't getting really better. It's just getting worse. So we clearly have to do something about that. Now, end days are recognized as a major threat by many organizations, uh, as witnessed by the results of a couple of studies. So a few years ago, Verizon did a study where they concluded that 99.9% .9 of exploits were of end day vulnerabilities that had been disclosed for over a year. So what this indicates is that uh, organizations or individuals or the people who are running the software and their systems are not being proactive in defending against them, but even simply by um, applying the patches that already exist. Now, in many cases, that can be very, very difficult. I acknowledge that, but still 99.9% .9 is an astonishing number. The US federal government have done a couple of studies of their systems, both their information technology systems as used in the various agencies, and of systems that are used to control weapons systems as run by the Department of Defense. And they concluded that because of their reliance on both commercial software and open source software, in many forms, they are very severely at risk from end day vulnerabilities. So uh, the biggest example, or the most significant example that I'm aware of uh, is the Equifax data breach from 2017. So Equifax is a credit reporting agency. Its customers are organizations like banks or mortgage companies or credit card companies. So anybody who wishes to extend an individual credit will go to a company like Equifax and ask for credit scores or credit information on, on the individual asking for the credit. So they maintain these enormous databases of individuals and of course they're all associated with their social security number, uh, which is uh, these days is pretty important to keep that number private. Uh, so the breach at Equifax allowed the bad guys to steal all that information for almost 150 million Americans. Now the cost of styring, the cost of Equifax uh, was at least $380 million and possibly estimated up to about $600 million. But that was just the cost to them. The cost to the Americans, that is the people who were, whose personal information was, uh, was leaked, is estimated to be about $1.4 and what's interesting about this 
situation is that the cost was not borne by the company or the customers of the company. It was borne by the people, the, you know, the, the man on the street, if you like, who, uh, whose information was used by this company. But the, the important thing to point out here is that this was possible because the, the, the attackers exploited an M-Day vulnerability in the Java Struts framework. So this was something that was known to be a problem, and yet they left it unpatched, uh, despite the fact that, that uh, they were at severe risk. So now let's talk a little bit about the risks of third-party software. So almost all organizations these days use open source software in some form or another, whether it's an operating system that you're dependent on, like Linux or one of the other real-time operating systems that are open source, or some set of libraries and so on. So if you go out there and look for open source software, it's, it's staggering just how much of it is available. Uh, so this is a snapshot from libraries.io from a few months ago. Uh, so that is a website that tracks package managers. Uh, package managers are the you know, typical way that people get uh, distributions of open source software. And you can see up there they have in excess of 7.5 million open source packages uh, across 37 package managers. And so as a consequence of this, it's, it's extremely tempting for organizations to reach out and use this open source software. And it makes economic sense for the most part for them to do so uh, because it's, um, uh, it's software that has uh, some level of maturity and, uh, and, and is expected to work reasonably well. And for the most part it does, but the problem is every time you reach out for an open source package, you may also be bringing in security vulnerabilities that will put yourself at risk without your knowledge. Uh, so the problem is that uh, uh, when you do use open source software, uh, or indeed software from any third party, uh, there's a, a huge web of dependencies that exist in, between uh, software components. So your custom code uh, may rely directly on open source code, but that may transitively depend on additional open source components that transitively depend on others. So what you end up with is a bit of an iceberg kind of thing that looks a bit like this, where at the top you've got the stuff which is obviously visible, the executable that you're creating, the, uh, or the, um, the set of libraries that you're creating, uh, and so on. And if they start to depend on other things, then you can gradually bring in lots and lots of other stuff, uh, sometimes unknowingly, uh, because it's not always obvious that uh, these dependencies exist for various reasons. And as a consequence of that, if you don't know the security risk of those dependencies, then you may be putting your own software at risk. Uh, so, uh, so that's end-day vulnerabilities and the risks of using open source. Uh, let's talk about techniques for finding end-day vulnerabilities. So the main technique that's used these days is something called software component analysis. Now this is a fairly well-established technique, at least for source code. It uh, works as follows. So typically there is a database of known components that are identified by signatures. And these signatures can take various forms. They can be just uh, snippets of bytes. They can be sequences of, of things. They can be hashes and so on. But the point is that there is this uh, a large database, and so when you want to know what's in your software, uh, what the analysis does, the, the software component analysis that is, is to uh, look up your software in the database of known components, and what the output of that is called a bill of materials. So a bill of materials basically lists the components alongside their versions, and Sometimes you get other information like the origin, the author, the license even. Uh, but the bill of materials is basically the set of ingredients, the exact set of ingredients that went into creating the software that's being analyzed. Once you have the bill of materials, then you can look up the components in various databases to understand if there have been any security vulnerabilities reported against those components. Uh, 
the main source for vulnerability information these days is the CVE. So that's a, a resource that's run by a nonprofit called MITRE that's funded by the U.S. government. And, um, and so that's basically a catalog of uh, vulnerabilities that have been reported uh, for which there is some sort of evidence. There are other such resources, but, but typically uh, a CV identifier is the canonical way in which people refer to vulnerabilities in software. And, and so having done that lookup, uh, you can then uh, report if there are any end day vulnerabilities in the software. So what I just described is a fairly well established technique for source code. And uh, the reason it works well for source code is because source code is very much like text. And there are many, many techniques uh, as pioneered by search engines like Google and, and, and so on th that are designed to do information retrieval on text that scale to enormous levels and work, which work very well with uh, reasonable numbers of false positives and false negatives. So techniques that work well for uh, information retrieval, uh, just in general, work well for doing source code analysis and they include things like hashing, signature matching, doing n-grams, and, and, and so on. There are dozens of techniques that, uh, which I won't go into here, but they're all based on text. Now, unfortunately, those techniques don't work really well at all for doing binary software component analysis. So with binary software component analysis, and by binaries here, what I mean are um, executables and DLLs and shared objects and object files and so on that contain machine code. Um, now, the, the problem is still there for, uh, for bytecode, but it's much, much less acute for various reasons. Uh, what, what we are targeting here is machine code binaries. And the reason it's hard is because the uh, original source code gets compiled and possibly it goes through other transformations, and uh, those serve to obfuscate the origin of the source code. Now, binary software component analysis has lots of applications. There are basically three major use cases uh, that I'll just go over very briefly here. The first is if an organization is developing their own software, and they're reaching out and getting some open source software or getting some software in binary form from the supplier, and incorporating that in. It's very common. Most organizations do this in one form or another. So having a tool that will uh, look at those binaries will help them improve their security. Uh, in the middle here are organizations doing product development, such as for automobiles or medical devices and so on. In those organizations, it's very common for them to uh, contract out software development, at least some of it. And uh, the deliverables from that contracting are, are often in the form of binaries only. And uh, then what they have to do is basically just trust their supplier to have done due diligence about looking for security vulnerabilities in that code. And that's a bit of a passive approach because, uh, you know, how do you trust your supplier? Um, how do you know that you have uh, confidence in your supplier? Uh, that can be very difficult to, to really figure out, um, especially for uh, offshoring uh, situations and so on. The third use case is where an organization is just using off-the-shelf software. So if you install Zoom on your computer or whatever, typically you, you reach out, you get an installer, and that installer copies a bunch of binary files onto your system, uh, and many of those are going to be machine code binaries, so, so that when it runs, uh, if those binaries contain any components that are known to have security vulnerabilities, that could be putting your machine at risk. And this is particularly important for organizations that have regulatory requirements that they remain secure. So for example, a bank may not develop their own software for, for doing just day-to-day -day administration and so on. Uh, they're, they're certainly going to be um, getting third-party software in, but because they have, they're regulated, they have to be assured that that software is free of security vulnerabilities. 
And if they don't know what's in it, then again, they're just trusting your supplier, and that's generally not a, a very active way of, um, of approaching the problem. So let's talk a little bit about finding end days in binaries. So I alluded to this a little bit before, but let me explain why it's difficult. So the problem is that the, the final result of a software development activity is typically some binary code. It's an executable or it's a set of DLLs or so on. And so the question you need to ask if you're doing software component analysis is what components are in that? That is, what code was statically compiled into that uh, binary? And furthermore, what versions of code uh, were found in there? Now, when the code was compiled originally, the components were known and the versions were known. But the problem is that um, if all you have is the binary, you don't know what came before. Uh, and what comes in between are a, whole, a huge set of transformations and tool chains that really kind of hide the, the origin of the source code. So, for example, uh, it's pretty common for organizations to fork a repository, an open source repository, make changes to it, and then use that in their application. Uh, and uh, those refactorings can be arbitrarily large. Uh, but, uh, of course, they may also include security vulnerabilities that have been inherited from the original. But the biggest problem is with compilers, because compilers uh, create machine code from source code. And often it's very, very difficult to, to tell uh, what the original source code was uh, for various reasons. So here's, a, here's the critical challenge here. So if all you're looking at is the source code, then it's easy to find out, or it's relatively easy to know where the source code came from. But if all you have is the, the binary code, then uh, you have to think about the ways in which the, the source code might have been compiled. So what you see here is that the same source code can be compiled in very different ways by different compilers. And as a consequence of that, it's going to look very, very different. Uh, so these are listings, assembly code listings of a function that was an OpenSSL uh, in which was the weakness that led to the Heartbleed bug from a few years ago. The one on the left was compiled with GCC. The one on the right was compiled with Clang. And as you can see, those instruction streams look not at all alike. Uh, there are a few instruction matches in there, but uh, but if you have a um, one of those techniques that looks at the text of the instructions, um, such as what works pretty well for source code, well, that, that's not going to work at all well for binary code because uh, the, the, the instruction stream is going to look very different depending on how it was compiled. And it's not just true across uh, different families of compiler. It's true between different ways in which the code might be compiled by the same compiler. So if you use GCC and set different optimization flags on the command line, then you're going to get code that looks very, very different than if you hadn't used those optimization flags. And furthermore, even if you use the same optimization flags across versions of the same compiler, you can still get very different code. So it's, it's, it's quite tricky to nail this down. And, and that's what the, the key technical challenge is. So, um, but we've been working on this for a bunch of years uh, in order to uh, create this new product, Code Sentry. So let me tell you a little bit of how that works. So the approach is, it's a bit like biometrics. It's also a bit like archaeology in the sense that you've got this big pile of stuff and you're sifting through it and looking for tiny pieces of evidence to tell you a little bit bit about the origin. So most of what you're going to be looking at is not going to be interesting. It's not going to help you conclude what software was used to compile this program. Uh, but uh, little bits of evidence can be sifted out. And there are various ways of looking at the binary. Uh, there are techniques that just look at the stream of bytes. So you can compute hashes. 
And that sometimes works, uh, but it's very fragile in that if there are even tiny differences, then you get different hashes. Uh, it turns out that there's a fair amount of signal in strings. So if you just take a binary and pull out all the strings, uh, that can be helpful. Or you can look at symbols, or you can actually look at the instructions. But the key thing here is that none of these techniques on their own is likely to give you enough of a signal uh, most of the time to tell you what, uh, what the original source code was. So instead, what you need to do is to combine them. And that what you end up with is a certainty level. Uh, that is a level of confidence in the, in the conclusion. And you can use that to assess your risk. So let's say a little bit more about some of these uh, different techniques. They roughly fall into two categories. There are properties where uh, the analysis is just looking at the, at the bytes. Uh, and there are properties that look a bit more deep. So uh, the best example is strings. So uh, what you're showing in the what I'm showing you on the right there is basically a octal dump of a binary. It's a fragment of it, of course. It's much much larger than that. And within there, within every binary, there are typically embedded strings, and those strings can contain text, you know, readable human English, natural language text. And those carry a signal. So if I highlight that one, Salt Lake City shows up here for some reason. Who knows why? Um, but those typically are, um, or at least a set of them, are useful for finding out what the original source code was. So this is particularly useful if you have things like error messages show up in here. Because error messages tend to be fairly idiosyncratic and not very common across different packages. Uh, and if you get super lucky, you will actually even find a version string that has been embedded into the binary by the compiler at the time the thing was built. Now, this is by no means universal. Some organizations uh, are, uh, are pretty good about doing this kind of thing, but for the most part, they don't. You, you, you have to rely on other evidence. If you do find a version string, then that's pretty much the gold standard. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's something that uh, conveys a very strong amount of evidence. So the combination of the strings uh, and so on is useful. We can also have symbols and so on, but I won't say much about that. I'm trying to forward here. And my, oh, here we go. Yeah. A bit of lag there. Uh, so the, the next set of properties are those where the actual instruction set architecture is taken into account. So these are typically looking at the, the binary in terms of uh, it as a stream of instructions. And these properties, of course, require the, the, the raw bytes to be decoded into instructions, which means you need an analysis that understands what those instructions are. The code center tool that I mentioned um, is capable of analyzing X, X64, X86, and ARM binaries. So the way it works is the input is the user binary. Uh, that gets decoded. Well, first it gets pulled apart. So not all parts of a user binary are instructions. But you find the code segments, first of all. Then you decode them. And you find the boundaries between the procedures. And now that in itself is, is typically straightforward for a lot of programs, but it's by no means universal. So this is an approximate matching uh, thing because uh, machine code can be so complicated, it's, it's very difficult to get something that's going to be a perfect matching, even if you want to uh, do something that sounds as simple as finding procedure boundaries. So then uh, what the analysis does is extract features. Now, I'm going to be pretty vague about what these features are, because it turns out, as I'll explain later, that they, the set of features that are important is uh, something that's going to be automatically selected by a machine learning algorithm. Can you see my slides now? Uh, yes, I can, I can see your slides. And am I live? Yes, you, you are live now. Okay, I'm live. Um, okay. 
Yes, uh, sorry about that, everybody. Um, I really don't know what happened, um, but uh, things got a little choppy for me, and I just learned that uh, that the presentation got broken off at about this point. So I'm going to rewind. Um, uh, to me, everything looked like it was going fine after it was after it started stopped being choppy, but um, I'll rewind to this point. Um, so what I was describing was that uh, there are ways of uh, uh, computing similarity, and um, and so what I wanted to do was to explain how the machine learning was used to uh, compute that similarity. So think of this as analogous to doing uh, to machine learning that is uh, set up to recognize individuals in photographs. What you typically do is you train the machine on a set of inputs uh, for which the result is known. Then hopefully if you show it some inputs where the result is not known, it can, it can learn. It can use what it has learned uh, to come up with the correct conclusion. So it's, it's very analogous to that. So typically what we do is uh, the learning phase takes source code for which the component name and the version of the component is known, then that source code we compile in lots of different ways, varying the compiler, uh, the compiler family, and the version of the compiler, and even the flags that are passed into the compiler. That produces a whole set of binary outputs. And then the machine learning will extract those features, those abstract features that I talked about earlier. And um, it does this completely automatically. It, it uh, decides what features are important and which carry the most signal. And that goes into a uh, neural network style machine learning algorithm uh, to produce a, a model. And the model is useful because the, because the inputs are known, the component and the version of the component. Um, you end up with a set of semantic signatures which uh, can be used to do the matching. So then hopefully when you see uh, some code that has been compiled with a compiler you've never seen before, uh, you will have some chance of recognizing it. So uh, we've implemented these techniques in Code Sentry, which is our new tool for doing binary software component analysis. And so that's what you're seeing here. So this is a uh, a web application, so I've uploaded in this case a single file, it's qt5gui.dll. You can upload a zip file or an installer, for example, as well if you like. But what, what I've done is upload that and ask it to find the components and it's given me back this bill of materials report. So the bill of materials shows that it has found two components, libpng and libiconf. Libiconf is okay, it looks like it's safe. It looks like version 1.15 of that has not had any vulnerabilities reported against it. So, uh, so that's good. But libpng, it turns out, has several vulnerabilities reported against it uh, for that particular version. So this is a version uh, from a few years ago. It's 1.5.10. And you can see in that column uh, where the colors are that the uh, th there are several serious vulnerabilities. So you can drill down into that to the vulnerabilities view. And what, what this shows you is the set of CVEs that have been reported against that version of that library. So um, now I, I, if you recall, I said earlier that CVEs are the canonical way in which uh, vulnerabilities are typical ref typically referred to these days. So, um, so when one is reported, it's given a unique number, and that's uh, uh, that's how you get to further information about them. So, so you notice at the right there, there's one critical uh, CVE. Notice that these uh, CVEs are categorized into low, medium, high, and critical severities. Uh, and uh, that helps you assess the risk. Now, if you want to find out more, you can click through and get to the CVE site. So that's what that is. Uh, it tells you a little bit about how the thing was uh, reported. It tells you um, a little bit about the uh, the problem that was found in the code. In this case, 
libpng before 1.6.32 does not properly check the length of chunks against the user limit. So it's a little hard to tell exactly what that means. Uh, but um, <clears throat> this looks and sounds very much like a buffer overrun vulnerability. And if you click further into the uh, national vulnerability database listing for this, you can see that uh, the, um, it is scored it. Uh, so we see the severity score there is 9.8, uh, critical. So what that means is that it's likely to be something that will allow an attacker to take complete control of the process that's running uh, that code. So um, uh, Code Sentry also has reports. So if you ask for the report, you get it in PDF form. So you can see the uh, executive summary there that has a dashboard in it. And uh, that breaks the score down into its various components. Um, and you can see on the right, there's the build materials view. And then you can drill down even further to get details on each of the findings. Uh, so this shows the, the different findings for the different uh, uh, things in which this, uh, this risky code was found. Okay, so um, conclusion is this. So first of all, end day vulnerabilities are abundant uh, and the situation is getting worse. In a sense, they're much, much more risky than zero day vulnerabilities because of the lag uh, that organizations have uh, in applying patches or taking other mitigations. Um, it's particularly important to understand your risk of your supply chain. And if somebody is supplying you with binaries, uh, then it's wise to check those binaries to make sure that they do not contain things that are known to have vulnerabilities in them. And so the tool used for this is software composition analysis tool. Uh, as I explained earlier, uh, that's an established practice for source code, but not for binary code. Code Sentry is now available to help you with binary code software composition analysis. Uh, so that's, uh, that's all I've got. Sorry about that technical glitch. Um, and uh, I think the plan now is to head over to the session where I will take questions over there. So I'm going to stop sharing and uh, move over to there. So thank you. If I don't see you in the uh, Q&A session, then uh, thank you for coming to my talk.